why is this society so tolerant for display of violence and so Puritan when it comes to dirty words? It's, a, uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, I think we don't have, for some reason, we don't have taboo words for violence, even though many people are opposed to violence. The word kill, even the word rape, for some reason did not fall on the other side of the boundary to become taboo. Uh, religious words used to be taboo, damn, hell, Jesus Christ, God. Uh, and then starting in several hundred years ago, there was a switch in English-speaking countries uh, from religious uh, uh, taboo words to sexual and excretory taboo words. It probably came during a point in European history when there was a gradual um, uh, attempt across societies to get people to mm -hmm. inhibit their impulses, to be less impulsive, less biological, uh, to control their uh, emotions, and words that evoked strong emotion were just not uh, tolerated anymore. Is there more Puritanism now than there was, say, in the 70s and the 80s? Uh, I think there's more divisiveness. I think the population as a whole uses these words and tolerates these words much more. But the minority of American cultural conservatives, uh, represented now by the Bush administration, has uh, tried to fight back and use this as a symbol of the decay of culture. Even hypocritically, wh while those very leaders uh, use those very words, uh, Famously, Dick Cheney in uh, the uh, U.S. Senate told a senator to, I don't know if I can say this on Belgian television, <laughs> he said, fuck, fuck yourself. Uh -huh. uh, uh, George Bush famously used the, these words with uh, Tony Blair uh, when he thought that microphones weren't picking up their speech. John McCain called his wife uh, a uh, very obscene word. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, there's a lot of hypocrisy. Tony, mm. did you hear in 1992 John McCain called his wife a cunt in front of a group of reporters? What? She said he was losing some hair, and he said, at least I don't plaster on the makeup like a trial up, you cunt. That's impossible. We would have heard about that on the news. Mm. Then he says, he turns to his wife and says, yeah, well, at least I don't plaster on the makeup like a trollop, you cunt. What? That's yeah. what he says. It's no. huge. Are we going to run this over and over again like we did the Reverend Wright stuff? No, we're not running this story. What? I can't exactly see the word cunt on TV, can I? We're not going to run a legitimate news story because a word makes people squeamish? It's on the Internet. And if we were on the Internet, we could use it as much as we wanted. We could say McCain and cunt over and over again until it's seared into your brain. Just like McCain, cunt, McCain, cunt, cunt, McCain, cunt. Well, no, you'd need to be more artful about it than that, like if it were me, I'd say, John McCain, yes we cunt. Straight cunt express. Yeah. No cunt tree for old man. See, that's oh. Now we're yes. thinking, that's, that's what we're talking about. John McCain called his wife the worst word there is. She's not even black. Oh, no, no, no. no. Uh, uh, they got John McCain called his wife a cunt. No way. God, if we were on the web, we could use the power of repetition until when you think John McCain, you think... Called his, his wife, wife a cunt. cunt. Yeah. yeah. As we are here downtown, anxiously awaiting the arrival of Senator John McCunt. Oh, God. I'm fired, aren't I? Yeah. Yeah. John McCain called his wife a cunt. Why is crap acceptable? Shit is not. Why are words dirty? Words aren't dirty by themselves. They're not, not dirty, they're not clean. It is a, a purely social phenomenon. That is... I use the word shit if I want to offend you or at least wake you up. And why does it work? Because you know that I've used it to offend you. How do you know that I've used it to offend you? Because I know that you're going to react that way and that you know that I know that you know that I know. So it's a funny process of positive feedback. And like positive feedback processes, it can often be capricious how it develops. Why one word? Why not another word? Uh, and I think like many social trends, it's impossible to predict it exactly, although you can say what the probabilities are. So the probability is that any word that can evoke a strong negative emotion is more likely to become a taboo word than a word for a pleasant or a neutral experience. But which word and which emotion, that varies with history. Apart from religion, excretion, are there other sources of taboo words? Death and disease. Uh, mm -hmm. In Polish and Yiddish, uh, one curse is cholera, 
cholera. And someone told me that in the Netherlands, one of the worst things you can say to someone is get cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and even in English, cancer is not a strictly a taboo word, but it's heading in that direction. And often obituaries will say that someone died of a long illness. They won't use the word cancer. Mm -hmm. What about the minorities? You didn't mention homosexuality, you didn't mention... Oh, that. that's yeah. one of the biggest. And in yeah. fact, people don't think of that as swearing. They mm -hmm. don't think of words like nigger and faggot and, and kike as swear words. But they really are like swear words. They are taboo in the sense that it's considered a sin to say them aloud. And they are by far the most offensive words in uh, contemporary American English. Someone says, if I were to say shit in a lecture, no big deal. If I were to say nigger in a lecture, unless it was a linguistics lecture, I could be fired. But it's different with rappers, for instance. They can do it. A lot of taboo words can be used uh, in, in very specific contexts that remove the taboo. Um, taboo words for sexuality, of course, can be used for sexual arousal. Mm -hmm. uh, talk dirty to me mm -hmm. is what is the famous formula for, mm -hmm. for sexual arousal. And offensive terms for minorities can be used by the members of the minorities themselves either to defang them, to say how bad can this word be if I am showing you now that, I'm, that it doesn't hurt me, but also as a measure of uh, solidarity. Often friends prove that they're friends by teasing each other, insulting them, each other, putting themselves down, and members of an in-group can do that as well. So it happens among African Americans with mm -hmm. nigger. Uh, many women refer to each other privately as bitch, but <laughs> God help the man who does that. Uh, and, and that is true for all of the taboo words. The history of the word, the word negro, nigger, black person, African American, that's quite interesting, isn't it? Yes, as a word, there's nothing special about nigger. It comes from the Spanish negro, black, which is just the same as black. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's part of a, a sound change that very often happens in languages. You go from e to i, as in uh, we have the word creek, but it's often pronounced crick. Um, you often reverse uh, an r and another uh, vowel next to it. That happens very often. Why it uh, that word in particular became the offensive term probably is simply because the southerners and the slave owners tended to use that uh, there's nothing about the word itself that became taboo in the 20th century uh, and when I was a child uh, Negro was a perfectly acceptable mm -hmm. word mm -hmm. uh, you still have the United Negro College Fund and Martin Luther King mm -hmm. talked about Negroes yep. but in the late 60s that very quickly shifted to black uh, the rationale at the time was that if you call European Americans white, you need a perfectly symmetrical term for, for fairness. Uh, but then it's a mystery. If that's true, then why in the 1990s was there the switch to African American? Uh, because you don't talk about European Americans. My own theory is that it has nothing to do with meaning. It has only to do with uh, emotion. And that is that if there is a group that's the, a target of racism, then any word used to describe it will soak up those negative connotations. And then you want to bring in a fresh one that doesn't have the, those negative associations, but over time, it in turn will soak up those negative associations, and you'll need another replacement for it, and you go around and around and around. And we, it's not just racial terms, but uh, terms for excretion, you know, toilet, washroom, bathroom, lavatory, comfort station, uh, terms for garbage, uh, garbage collection then became sanitation, and now it's environmental services. So what about sex? You speak about arousing, arousing uh, negative, negative feelings, yes. negative emotions. There's nothing negative about sex. Everyone likes sex, isn't it? Yes. Well, the, the, the two parties who are engaged in sex might like it, but there may be a wider circle of people who don't like it so much, such as romantic rivals, such as people who are concerned about an illegitimate child, uh, such as um, uh, 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 cases in which the couple is not consenting, as in rape or deception or exploitation, uh, jealous partners, parents and grandparents. Sex is not really a matter of just two people, uh, and it's not always voluntary and mutual. So it's something that all humans have strong emotions about. 
uh, and those are the emotions that words about sexuality can evoke. You have um, an interesting theory about transitive and intransitive verbs <laughs> yeah. to describe the sexual act. What's, what's, what's going on there? Well, in, in English, all of the transitive verbs for sex are, are uh, taboo. Um, what goes into the slot, John verbed Mary, uh -huh. uh, is a transitive verb with a direct object. Well, as John screwed Mary, John fucked Mary, John shagged Mary, not taboo, but a little bit rude or, or, or jocular. Uh, what are all the polite terms for sex? John had sex with Mary. John made love to Mary. Uh, John went to bed with Mary. They're intransitive. They have a preposition. They are also um, euphemisms in the sense that the words don't actually refer to sex. Love, bed, sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, those are actually words for something else mm -hmm. that are being used to, uh, to refer here to sex. So there are two, it's as if they, we have two different models for sex, mental models. One of them is a man does something to a woman, uh, uh, something physical. The other is a man and a woman jointly agree to do something together whose details we're not going to think about. Those are the two models. And we have further evidence from the metaphors based on sex in English and, and other languages as well. Like this is fucked up uh, or screwed up, meaning damaged or he screwed me or he fucked me over meaning exploited so the taboo mental model for sex is not just that a man does something to a woman directly but in doing so he's exploiting her and he's damaging her there's a good reason why that where that mental model uh came from but uh it's one that we all recognize but it's one that we don't like to acknowledge does that apply to other languages as well because in dutch for instance i don't there's some pretty strong uh, offensive words that are intransitive. Yeah, no, it doesn't apply uh, to uh, all languages, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it, it's not just English. Uh, I believe in uh, Brazilian Portuguese, for example, you have something similar. A special case is, fuck you. Which is uh, kind of mysterious. For one thing, no one knows what it means. Uh, if you ask people, they say, well, I don't know. I mean, fuck yourself? Does it mean get fucked? Does it mean I'm going to fuck you? Uh, and also, it doesn't fit the syntax of English. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it should be fuck yourself is grammatical. Fuck you doesn't even fit the syntax of, of English. Uh, I, th I think the, what happened is that in the transition from religious to sexual swearing, a lot of idioms that would made sense on religious grounds, uh, people just uh, took out the religion word, put in a sexual word, even if it made no sense. So, damn you makes sense. It means, may you be damned. Uh, but when people didn't literally believe that you could send someone else to hell, and they needed a word with the same emotional punch, they took out damn, they put in fuck. And that's why a lot of English idioms don't make any sense. Close the fucking door. I mean, it's not like the door's having sex. Where did that come from? Well, close the damned door does make sense. Uh, likewise, holy shit or holy fuck. Again, it's completely mysterious, but Holy Mary is where it came from. And again, Holy Mary didn't get a rise out of people, so you slot it in another word. So why do we swear? There isn't one reason, because the common denominator of swearing is simply arousing emotion in your listener by the use of a word. And there are lots of reasons that people may want to arouse emotion in their listener. Uh, one of them is to remind the listener of how awful or emotional something is. So if I'm um, a nurse in a doctor's office, I might say we need a stool sample, not we need a shit sample, because I need to refer to it somehow, but there's no reason to, for us to think about how offensive it is. But if someone is letting his dog uh, foul my lawn, I might say clean up your dog shit, where I want to remind him that this is an offensive substance. So one is just, do you want to emphasize the negative aspects of a phenomenon or do you want to hide them? Another reason is you may want to uh, just arouse your listener's attention uh, to, if you think that your listener just not, doesn't care, if you say close the fucking door, just the fact that fucking is an arousing word means he listens a, a little more and he th thinks that you are in mean business, that, you, that you're serious about it. Uh, those are two of the, f of the main reasons. When I uh, hit my finger instead of the nail well, that's a third one, and I think that that's a, a different, uh, yet another phenomenon. 
I think it partly comes from a reflex that we inherited from other animals, where if we're suddenly injured or con an animal is suddenly injured or confined, it will erupt in a furious struggle accompanied by a loud noise. And presumably that was a reflex of defense against uh, being injured by another animal. I think we've inherited that reflex, but in our case, we have this extra language system that's in our brain that also controls our vocal tract. So instead of just going, ah, we articulate our yelp with a word that we ordinarily inhibit ourselves from producing and a word that is uh, connected with negative emotion. You also write about violence, about the evolution of, of violence in history. Your thesis is there's less violence now than there used to be. Can you explain that? Yes, uh, by, many, uh, by many measures. And some of them we can know just by opening up a, a history book. Um, the number of uh, capital crimes has uh, diminished to zero in most countries. I live in one of the few industrial countries that does have capital punishment. Mm -hmm. Here we still have it for murder in two-thirds of the states, but in Europe it's gone. And it used to be you could have capital punishment for uh, insulting the king, insulting the religion, spreading gossip, shoplifting. The way the capital punishment or punishment in general is carried out has changed. In, in Europe, in the Middle Ages, there were horrific forms of torture and mutilation that are gone. But e more quantitatively, uh, the rate of homicide in every European country has plummeted since the Middle Ages, uh, reduced by a factor of between 10 and 100. The, since uh, World War II, the number of interstate wars and deaths from interstate wars has gone down. Um, more recently, since the end of the Cold War, in around 1990, the number of civil wars has gone down, a number of genocides. So we seem to be in a midst of trends of trying to move away from violence, and it is a profound puzzle, a mystery, why that should be happening. What's the, uh, the relation between your language studies and your study of violence, for instance? Oh, uh, <clears throat> human nature. Uh, what makes us tick? What's a human being? Language was, is relevant, to, has been relevant to that at least since the late 1950s when uh, Noam Chomsky, my former colleague at MIT, argued that humans have an innate capacity to acquire language, that the human mind is not just a homogeneous um, learning device that just soaks up information from the environment, but that we are programmed with certain co cognitive abilities. Well, that leads to the question, if language is a uh, human instinct, what are the other human instincts? What are our emotions? What are our cognitive abilities? If there is a human nature with many parts and faculties, does that mean we're doomed to repeat our behavior without changing through history? Well, clearly not, because we have changed. What are the aspects of human nature that uh, make, first of all, make violence very probable throughout hi human history, but that also admit an opening for gradually reducing it in some places and times. What's the mystery of the mind that, well, that preoccupies, preoccupies you most right now? What, what is the mystery you want to, to solve? Well, right this minute, mm -hmm. it's what allows us to become less violent. Uh, more generally, I've been interested in uh, how children acquire language. Uh, when we use language, we don't blurt out what we say literally in so many words, but use euphemism and innuendo. Uh, in the past, I've been interested in how verbs work, uh, why some verbs are transitive and others are intransitive, and why there are irregular forms. Why isn't language perfectly logical with a rule for everything? Why in almost every language are there forms that you just have to memorize in English, you know, bring brought instead of bring bringed? Um, lots of mysteries, no shortage of mysteries. Does it all boil down to the question, how does the mind work? Uh, yes. Uh, well, with the violence, though, it's an interaction between how the, world, how the mind works and historical changes, technological changes, uh, particular events in world history that set us in this direction mm -hmm. or that direction. So it's not purely a psychological question. I'm interested in the psychological component, but to answer it, one also has to look at uh, chance events through history. How does academia look at your work about dirty words, for instance? Oh, <laughs> uh, 
Um, no, no problem. Uh, I think one of the, the wonderful things about academia is whatever subject it is, there's someone somewhere who studies it. I occasionally have gotten uh, a response when I talk about it in public. Uh, do you have to use those words? And the, my answer is yes. Uh, I am a, I'm a psychologist and a linguist. Uh, if we have an emotional reaction to some word, I think we should all step aside and ask, why do we have that reaction? We shouldn't just have that reaction and surrender to it, saying it makes me feel bad and that's good enough reason not to use it. We should be curious about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And part of that is hearing the words, gauging our own reaction, asking, why do I react that way to that word? And if you use a euphemism, if I were to say, why are we offended by the F word instead of why are we offended by fuck, it's not communicating the problem uh, clearly. Still, you draw a line in your book. There are some expressions and words you uh, uh, relegate to the, uh, to the notes. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, some of that, there, there was a... Uh, uh, a short discussion of, of, of uh, be bestiality that I thought, as a matter of taste, I put in the footnote. It also allowed me to uh, pretend to have at least some remnant of propriety left after this long chapter of using many of the words very often. You write learned books, but you also write uh, articles, uh, you give interviews, you write popular science books. Why do you do that? What's your message? Oh. Our message is uh, we can try to solve m mysteries. We can try to understand ourselves. We don't have to just accept um, our own reactions, other people's behavior as miracles, as uh, unpredictable uh, brute, f brute facts about the world. We can try to get insight. We can illuminate them. And I think that's a, a good thing. Thank you very much. My pleasure. <laughs>